Welcome, everyone. You are listening to The Last Dinosaur, and I'm your host, Chris Aversano. The Last Dinosaur is where we discuss the latest in digitization within the maritime space. Today's guest is Jan Hoffman, Head Trade Logistics at the UN Trade and Development. For those that are not familiar, UN Trade and Development works to ensure everyone benefits from the global economy. Established in 1964, the UN Trade and Development promotes the development friendly integration of developing countries into the world economy. It has progressively evolved into the authoritative knowledge-based institution whose work aims to help shape current policy debates and thinking on development with a particular focus on ensuring that domestic policies and international action are mutually supportive in bringing about sustainable development. Jan, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Welcome to my home office and very happy to be with you. (laughs) This is really exciting because if anybody who has followed LinkedIn and followed Jan, you see he posts some fantastic information and some fantastic stuff. And as I've kind of developed like, okay, who do I want to have on the on the podcast? Jan is one of the people I'm like, this is this is definitely a wish list. So Jan, tell us a little bit about what's going on uh, where you work in the UN and, and a little bit about kind of your own personal background, which I think is super fascinating. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, but, um, I like to say it's your taxes that pay my salary. So I better try and provide uh, good work and inputs and public goods uh, for for that, uh, my terms of reference. And yeah, at UNCTAD, United Nations Conference Trade and Development or UN Trade and Development, um, we like to say we think and we debate and we deliver. So thinking, that's the research part. That's where we a lot of what you see, what I share on LinkedIn is this public good maritime country profiles, our annual report, uh, statistics, um, uh, data sets, that, uh, new data set that estimates transport costs. So that's, um, yeah, that is thinking research, uh, including real s- studies. A um, recent one uh, we did for the IMO, for the Internet of Maritime Organization, very exciting what would be the impact on states, on their trade, on their GDP, on their prices of different potential uh, decarbonization measures. And that is a great practice. So I'm all members, states want to know, should I go this way or that way? And then we have done the research. And that links then to the second task of our work, which is the debate, where we come from, United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. We provide a forum for member states. They have meetings in Geneva and in our Palais des Nations, but also our work then supports negotiations in other multilateral fora like the WTO, World Trade Organization, where our work, I'm pretty confident, uh, has helped develop the WTO trade facilitation agreement, which I think might not have materialized without our support to the negotiations. And today we support the negotiations in London at the IMO to make sure to help uh, that the energy transition is is just, but also efficient and doesn't impact too negatively on on states. And then our third leg is the deliver the work on the ground uh, with the countries, helping them train port managers. Uh, modernize customs, uh, help set up single windows. We, we are not in the hard business. We are not financing or building infrastructure, but but giving advice, giving training, uh, going to the countries with assessments. And then you, you have a network of ports that work together that share data with you. You develop KPIs and that then comes into our research. And for me personally, as, as you asked, so I really feel very privileged, very lucky. I'm personally working on all three pillars. So I, I like research. I have somewhat academic background. I feel privileged to work with the delegates in Geneva, especially the delegates of the smaller countries. Imagine you are the delegate of, of Burundi or, or of Burkina Faso or of Tuvalu, and you have to negotiate at the World Health Organization, at the International Property Rights, and you have to negotiate whatever, uh, ITU, and and then we help them in our expertise to negotiate some of the things that are on on logistics. So I'm working on all three parts, including traveling, the deliver part. I've just counted, I've traveled to almost 140 countries. So that's part of the, what I feel privileged to do this. 
And as I'm in this position of, yeah, I'm, I'm head of a branch, uh, altogether 40 people uh, with, I believe, more than 40 passports, because some of them are more than one, very diverse, lovely, I really feel it's a great team in, in four different sections. So my work is to do yeah, some thinking, some organizing events, some technical assistance, some traveling, but also organizing all this and managing all this. So that's that's what I'm doing. I hope I've summarized it reasonably. It's amazing that, you know, the 140 that you mentioned plus mm -hmm. countries to go to. I thought I was like, oh, I think I've been to maybe 30. I was like, hey, that's pretty cool, you know, but 140, I got, I got a long ways to go. Mm -hmm. And certainly yeah. amongst your group there, um, you know, it's it's a wide thing. And, and having a diverse group is always, like you said, it allows you to view uh, problems or 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 issues from uh, you know a true global set because uh, it it is easy to kind of take the background from where you're from and 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 you know mm -hmm. or at least who you do business with and um, rather than you know everybody along the chain that you know yeah. could benefit like you said you work with the IMO saying okay we have to look at the impact of of decarbonization yeah. and, and you'll see lots of biased and unbiased opinions that are all over the road, but ultimately, you know, it's going to impact trade. But at the same time, you have small uh, company uh, countries mm -hmm. like, you know, Marshall Islands, which is kind yeah. of interesting, that has been very vocal yes. about these yeah. changes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I I was in person when one of the ministers was speaking at a, at a Connecticut Maritime Association event. Mm -hmm. He's like, we have to do something yeah, because yeah. – our nation sits where it does and it's, it, yeah, you know, yeah. and they need the data from you guys to, to yeah. help make their case. Marshall Islands, uh, I must say, I have a lot of respect for them. They're sitting between a rock and a hard place, if you want, but actually where they're sitting far out in the wide ocean. And, and they are among the countries most negatively affected by climate change. Right. They are also among the countries most negatively affected by any increase in shipping costs. Yeah. yeah? And still, they have understood it is in their interest to be proactive at the IMO and come up with co very constructive proposals about how can you decarbonize, like somehow delay, reduce uh, climate change from which they would be suffering, but also ensure that they would not be penalized uh, by having even higher shipping costs. No, Marshall Island is great and, and linking this like this personal part and the work part, uh, I, I do like to not only stay in the hotel in the ministry, but really get to the ground, to like leave the hotel and, and see. So so another little statistics, I've had my hair cut in 84 countries. Yes, uh, and you and you and you document this, don't you? I believe you 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 yeah. document this on your on your right. personal so blog. I have this if little I'm not blog yeah. post. Uh, it it shows that in order to export a service like the haircut, if there's a foreigner coming to a country having a haircut, this is an export of a service. But to export the service, the country first has to import the scissors and the machine, the shampoo. Yeah. And then I have my little statistics and, and, <laughs> and in the, in the many of the developed rich countries, the, say the shampoo, the scissor, the machine, may be national or at least regional production. Correct. But the service provider, the hairdresser, may often be a guest worker from abroad. Right. In the poorer countries, it's the opposite. You have the, um, the, the everything is imported, but the service provider is very likely local. So my hairdresser in, in Jamena or in Ouagadougou or in Bouvambouda, they, they were all locals. Yeah? And then you have some very exotic places, and that's why it came to my mind here. You mentioned Marshall Islands. So my hairdresser in the Marshall Islands was actually from the Philippines. Yeah, <laughs> So there, everything is Everything is, is important, right. right. And, it, and it gets back and... and, and... Uh, we'll get, we'll have a podcast about haircuts at some other point. Yeah, we'll invite cool. you on haircuts in the shipping industry. I don't know Perfect. if that'll be a thing, but, but one thing that is interesting is, is talking about, um, you know, the use of data. Right. Yeah. And I think that, uh, that the use of data and the digitalization of this process in the time that you've been there, you, you know, we talked beforehand yeah. been with the UN and UN related organizations for 30 plus years. Talk a little bit about that evolution, because, 
you know, we've gone from, you know, probably some of these places that we're talking about, some of the smaller places maybe had a, you know, a little bit of a dearth of information or at least it was hard to get out or, or you, because you didn't have a lot of trade partners and maybe some of that was protected to a different place. Talk a little bit about that evolution in the data gathering and digitization that's kind of helped you formulate some of these uh, action points for, you know, for everybody that you deal with. Yeah, no, no, you're absolutely right. And and you said over the years and looking back, uh, when I started my PhD, I worked with a hard disk. I was I was among the very first actually starting fully computerized. My hard disk had 20 megabytes. Yeah, so so that's a bit of a, a development since then. So over the decades, you do see to some extent really exponential growth on. And, and as economists, I would think demand, supply, and then market. So there's certainly also more demand for this type of data, digital solution. During COVID, we saw this a lot also in our work, uh, while some of our stakeholders, the, the customs authority, port authority, maritime authority, they were still happy with paper things work. And now they realize, hmm, maybe it's better if I accept electronic pre-arrival right. processing or e signatures if it was sitting in an office someplace and they either couldn't get to it or could right. only get to it twice a week with a, you know, full yes. body, body suit on exactly. and nobody else is in the office. Yeah. All of a sudden they're like, well, we need this data. Yeah. It's sitting Absolutely. in a post office box someplace yeah. that we can't get to physically or, or otherwise. Right, right, right. So, so the look at whatever, will there be a strike or not uh, in, in the U S now? And, right. and uh, the, the resilient support optimization, all these things, uh, lead to more demand for more data and digital solution. And then on the supply side, of course, it's amazing what is happening there with uh, satellite AIS data, what is possible nowadays with tracking, what is possible with the computing power, which is really like Moore's law going up, going up. Um, and then the, the AI tools, all this. So there's also more supply. So I see these both things together. And, and all of a sudden, finally, we seem to be getting to the evil of lading, which we have been talking about for 30 years, and it was still paper. No? So finally, the main stakeholders, the banks, the, the shippers, the carriers, they, they move together that, that step. So and if you bring this more demand supply together, um, one thing, I, it's a hypothesis I have, it leads, I think, less controversial for to more efficient markets. It's it's good. It's more efficient, more transparency. But this more efficient market also leads to more volatility, mm -hmm. uh, because it it allows stakeholders to respond, react faster. But also the the way the supply curve in shipping it can easily become very steep once you reach capacity limit. Yeah, and we are getting. Clo ever more often closer to the capacity limit because of good yield management, investment, good, better forecasting. Uh, you may also remember, I think we are both uh, old enough to remember when we were taking an aeroplane, there used to be empty seats next to us. Right. Do you remember? Yeah. And, and now um, there are no empty seats next to us because also the airlines are, are managing their managing seats the, better, Their capacity, yeah. The capacity and the... Freight rates for us, our airplane tickets have become more volatile. The prices Absolutely. are going very, and I think we see the same in shipping. Um, we saw like a nine fold increase of container freight rates during COVID. We saw again now a three and a half fold increase with the Red Sea problem. And this would not have happened the same way 10 or 20 years ago, or even longer ago when. We, in the 90s, when we still had the liner shipping conferences, you had some agreed freight rates, and you had a lot of wasted capacity. So yeah. the overall level might have been higher, but it was also more stable. It was also more stable. And I also think, too, is that I think you touched upon this, you know, our demand planning has, because of data, has gotten so fine-tuned that, that, yeah, that, that when something happens like this, it does – throw it out of whack. The one thing I do want to say is that something like the Red Sea, at least from my point of view, again, not having a container ship background, more of a, you know, more of a, a, a bulk background. Mm -hmm. But I, I would say that 
you know, you had the issue with, you know, the ever given that and you had the issue in the US with the Dolly and the Red Sea. You have seen one thing and maybe data has helped with the story of the flexibility to get around mm -hmm. those problems. Yep really pretty quickly now covid yeah. was a different point of view because it if it the impact was the supply of ships but also mm -hmm. where you were supplying the goods from i.e china and other mm -hmm. places but you've also seen and maybe some of your research has dictated this as well I've shown this in is that some of these people are looking for alternative supply points mm -hmm. as well which yeah. would then in future issues similar geopolitical um uh, you know health related change you know, maybe lessen that 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 curve as well. Um, I would imagine that data plays a big role in all that. Yes, yes. No, I think uh, even the impacts during COVID, which were bad, uh, but they would have been much worse if COVID had struck us 20 years earlier. I'm, it's hypothetical, but I'm pretty sure it would have been worse. So in the end, the shipping industry could respond quickly, move assets around the the yes, if you speak to to shippers, global shippers forum or global shippers alliance, they, they highlight the certain abuses and and like the carriers were allowed to drop a container in a different port than initially planned, and then they would still charge you if you don't pick it up on time. No, so so there were things that were not quite fair, and it is true that the shipping lines earned a lot of money during that period. For me, that these high freight rates are really part of that story I described earlier, this very steep supply curve. And if, if ships, ships spend 20% longer in port, this is a real reduction of capacity. The supply right. curve goes to the left, yep. and all of a sudden, it goes up ninefold, fivefold, different. The, the, the uh, charter rates went up ninefold. Now, with the um, Red Sea crisis, it is actually somewhat comparable in, in my view. It's not that ships now spend longer in port. There's a little bit, there was a bit of congestion in Singapore and so on, but no, they now spend 9% longer going around South Africa instead right. of Suez. Right. And, and, and all this, and then it's of course combined with the Black Sea crisis and the Panama lower capacity, all this together. And sanctions. To, and sanctions, yeah, yeah. All this together leads to the need for ships going longer distance, but it takes two, three, four years for a new ship to come to the market, to be delivered after it's ordered. So there, there has been this period where we again had a shortage of capacity and again, freight rates went up. No? It's, it's, it's really very interesting because it all, uh, you know, because you can look at it through the, the lens of data and some of the digital products that, you know, that people have uh, at the, in their offices for yourself. Uh, we talked a little bit uh, about kind of, and I found this fascinating a little bit on, um, I think you had a presentation that you shared before this on kind of the three mm. uh, stages of digitization mm. that you guys outlined, which I think is really, yeah. really interesting. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that because yeah. I think it's important because you could look at it from a different point of view. You know, we've looked at it here from member, from really from ship owners, charterers. We've had, you know, obviously people who build digital products. We've had some port folks on Beth Ann Rooney from uh, New York. We've had some other, we'll have one or two others, but, but from like the, the States that, that, that get involved with digitization and they have to kind of incorporate that. Some, like you said, who are, who are kind of smaller. And then obviously the big ones talk about the three stages of digitization. Yeah. I think this yeah. is, I've never seen this laid out like this. I think it's fascinating for our audience to, to hear your view. Yeah. I came from, from with some joint thinking also there was uh, SAP. So yeah, first stage is, is optimization. So you just maximize the efficiency, reliability of existing processes no one of my favorites is port call optimization oh you you why would you rush the ship and then wait uh, until the peer is really uh, available um little parenthesis uh, good old times when my father had his own little shipping company and was kept on his own ship he would always go as fast as possible because he preferred to spend time in port uh, and it was the charter we paid the fuel <laughs> so nowadays with more data and more control and more visibility it's a bit more difficult for a captain to claim that it was for weather or whatever reason that he had to rush yeah <laughs> so but, and then the next one is yeah, called extension. So moving beyond just efficiency, but, but new 
called sources of value are really new businesses. No, like right. there's so many new businesses. I, I I don't where to where to start. Like like connecting different providers, and then it links, of course, also to to the energy transition to to other aspects. Right. And the the third one, the whole transformation. Um, it's it is really we, we don't know where we are getting no and and uh, I, th I think later on we speak about a couple of books so so the whole thing of the singularity or AI or I only I'm convinced it will have huge impacts but which way we will be going we we don't know huh? no so the transformation is then that the new data and new players and in artificial intelligence lead to really yeah I I don't have other English language vocabulary, but it's beyond optimization or extension. It's really very new ways of doing business and new things, which um, if, if you look back when you moved from horses to cars or from when the internet came up or, or things, it's well, totally I think new. I think one of the biggest things is just right in our industry and, and you know, is... Um... The, the the Malcolm McLean going, hey, wait yeah, a minute, yeah, you could you could yeah. stick this stuff into a container. Exactly. Why not load the whole yeah. tractor trailer, yeah. Yeah. and then yeah. and then go put it on the back of a of a ship rather than taking out all the things. Half of it falls in the water, half of it yes. falls in somebody's pocket, and yeah, you're left yeah, with yeah. two thirds of what you really exactly. want. No, I exact. I think um, it's it's true. And in that PowerPoint I I shared with you, I I'm also using this comparison with a container. The the yeah the container nowadays it's taken for granted, but it was transformative. No. And and there are real studies that show that the introduction of containerization was more important as it had a bigger impact. You can go country by country because they were the containers were introduced in countries at different stages and trade right. routes at different stages. Right. You could actually see what happened. And I remember when I started working in Latin America almost 30 years ago, it was still like only reluctantly accepted in Venezuela to have containers because they said, no, we have enough manpower, we have enough work. So so the container would go to neighboring Curaçao or Aruba, would then be unstaffed and, and be consolidated <laughs> and would, would get a general cargo to Venezuela. So there you can really show this impact. And, and some studies that show the impact of containerization, they claim it was more important than liberalization and even more important than UNCTAD. It's Did interesting. It be, not? <laughs> it's, it's, I, I think containerization is, you know, if you're outside the industry is probably one of the most important yeah. things to happen. Like you said, to shipping, to people, to, to econ local economies, because you could be more efficient. And, and, and then also as, as kind of the Venezuelans will probably point out, well, I need less dock workers, you know, less, yeah. you know, if you look in the US, less union people, perhaps, and all this other stuff. But um, yeah, I mean, we could, re again, yeah. that could be a whole other podcast. Uh, but but as, as I said, but thanks for bringing this up, because this thing of transformation is, is very important there. The economic transformation is something that has to be carefully managed. When, yeah. when ports started modernizing and introducing private sector participation and containerization, um, one of the things we were working on uh, at that time, I was working for the UN in Santiago de Chile, was to make that transition socially softer, not, not just right. kick out the trade unions or, or, or yep. lose jobs, but but make sure that you do training. Yet you find, Because in the end, we were convinced, I'm still convinced, yes, you do save work in the port. You need fewer people it's true but you create more additional jobs in the hinterland for import export and so on and that's how it works we, we our great grandparents worked lived in a period where you had 80 percent of population working in agriculture right and the fact that they then worked industry and later in services doesn't mean that we are all unemployed or there's more poverty on the contrary but of course you have to manage this carefully this right transformation right. Right. And it's and it's, you know, and then it gets into a whole other thing that you deal with, especially I, I deal with a lot and on the digital side, and that's change management. Right. That's all just yeah. just yeah. just dealing with the change management. Uh, we talk a lot about the data. You know, we're getting more of it. I think as we spoke before, uh, I had a guest on who said that, you know, 90 percent of data doesn't come off of off, yeah. off of the ship. You know, it's kind of like land or ship locked, I guess. Looking at, you know, the data that you're getting, um, 
and the quantity and kind of the, the I would imagine over time you're going to get more and more of it. Is is this like the all pros or are there some cons? How do you how do you view that? I really see more pros uh, opportunity. Uh, this this impact assessment I mentioned earlier. What uh, where we are really proud of to to help IMO take the member states take an informed decision. This would not have been possible. I would say even ten years ago, we had something similar five years ago, but. So there are things that are only possible now with a combination of more data availability and also more computing power, because some of these simulations, I was told by our partners at Purdue University who run that GTAP model, they, they said that was good that we saved on heating because the computers were running hot. Uh, so even today, it was so much data. But overall, I, I admit, I, I, don't, I don't see any... Any negatives? Uh, I may be naive or always seeing the positive side of things, uh, but I, yeah, of course, it's an opportunity. It's, you, some people who in the past may have handled more paper or think you're losing the personal touch, and and it's true. I just was in a hotel where the the little delivery boy was a machine. Huh? So it comes like, and, 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 and you open this, uh, yeah, you lose the personal touch. Um, it requires, yeah, when you, when you bring up children and, and yourself, um, yeah, you, you must definitely find then other ways to keep personal touch on other areas. But that has happened all the time with any transition, any, any mechanization uh, uh, in agriculture and everything. So I, I see a lot of, potential and, and it's getting more and more the the, the one one um yeah saying I, I like to mention to, to what is happening there technological change will never be as slow as today mm. is it slow it's not slow it's fast but it's going to be even faster no? and of course uh it's it's frightening uh, to some extent but so far i see more opportunities than negative impacts well, let's talk a little bit about those opportunities, because one yeah. thing I love to ask my guests is, you know, in the shipping industry and, and or in the maritime space, you, you know, and, and kind of you got into it and, and you do a lot of other things besides maritime. It's more trade, but trade, I think, yeah. falls uh, or maritime falls under the umbrella of trade. I think if I'm thinking about it correctly, right, you have yeah. trade and then yeah. maritime yeah. is just part of it's a component. Uh, if yeah. someone was trying to get into the maritime space specifically, you know, whether it's to come to work mm. for you and, mm. and, and look at mm. this data or somebody else as you go along and speak. I, I know you just had a, a conference down in uh, mm. uh, down in the islands recently uh, as Vegas, part of your yeah. overall trade, which looked yeah. just fabulous. What would you tell somebody, maybe an intern or a young person saying, uh, you know, mm. I'm at a consulting firm. We kind of do some trade, but I really like maritime. What, what would you say? Because I, I, yeah. I think – the opportunity word is something that probably there's more opportunity to be involved in maritime and then trade ultimately or yeah. vice versa yeah. Uh, yeah. more than any time in the past, really, if you don't have a specific yeah. Yeah. Uh, shipping background. I mean, I love ships and containers and grains and uh, it's just beautiful. Um, but it's also true that I think more and more the shipping really is part of a bit broader supply chain, logistics and, and so on. And, and I, I've seen a report, and, and I, I want to find it to, to quote it properly, but a report of in which industry people are most happy. And logistics among those broader areas was the one where people are most happy. Uh, least happy, at least in that study, were architects. And you are surprising. Architects, you find maybe there's a bigger discrepancy between what you, you want to be creative and you end up just complying with some bureaucratic uh, rules, how much, what about cement density and whatever. While in logistics, you must work very, you must be very flexible. You work internationally. Um, specifically, if you asked, what, what do I recommend in, at the United Nations? It's languages uh, you, and, and experience and exposure and flexibility. Uh, uh, so if you are willing to, if you like working with people, if you like collaborating, don't like to think in silos, but really want to collaborate together with counterparts, clients, 
competitors in some way work together to to get the things right what is it uh, right thing right time right place at the right place pl a price so that's logistics uh, then according to some studies and my personal experience you are in the job that has most happy people i have to agree with you i, I had on a, a guest uh last year who was one of the co-founders of a company called vision and they do some container like tracking and things like that and and i, I go back to his kind of general comment is that what what he really is attracted to the space what tells other people is that he can make a very small change, what seems like a small change in efficiency or in container turnaround time. But if you're able to replicate that on a fleet and then on a section of trade or whatever, you're talking about, you know, first millions and then billions and then trillions of that you're impacting. And if you can have a half a percent change in yeah. a trillion dollar industry, yeah. that's a lot of money. And that goes into some of the challenges that the shipping industry is looking at today, in particular uh, emissions and, yeah. and, and yeah. even yeah. more equality. I mean, you could get into a whole other aspect, which we haven't really touched upon, but all those sort of challenges that the shipping industry, maritime industry is facing, yeah. I think they need yeah. a diverse workforce. And I think that that goes yeah. into the under uh, the umbrella of, of logistics and of course, trade as well. Yeah, yeah. No, and this this workforce. Uh, find it interesting to see the the difference between the people working on a ship and the people working ashore is getting less less because right. uh, because of communication and, and technology. So somebody ashore can also see through different sensors if the engine is right now heating up, and and the captain on the ship has full information about weather and rerouting and port core optimization. And and we have seen uh, more and more uh, like, like captains then also working three months per year uh, in the headquarters working on routing and so I think that's that's positive because uh, let's admit uh, although I said all the beautiful things, things about working logistics working as a seafarer without communication and, and during COVID when they had to stay yeah. much longer than planned can be quite quite bad quite quite yeah. Sad. Yeah, you and, and we, we've pretty, touched upon it. We'll continue yeah. to, to talk upon yeah. that. Uh, just to as we wrap up, and yeah. if you're watching, I, I've been doing a couple of video clips, so you'll see the video yeah. clips. Probably uh, there was a, a website, I think it's still active, called Room Raider, um, mm. and they would when people would go on TV during COVID, they'd say, "Look at this room," you know. Mm. And Jan is probably my first ten out of ten. I hope I'm not <laughs> insulting anybody else, but certainly he's a ten out of ten here with his bookshelf. So he has tons of books. Um, so Jan, what are you reading now? You know, oh. and, and and especially given your position and your mm. uh, your your position of research and your PhD. So obviously, well well read, well learned man, well traveled man uh, in terms of all your travel so what do you what are you chucking in the bag yeah. these days cool yeah no you had warned me so so i pulled out the the four books that were lying next to my bed in, in my bedroom uh, and put them here and and interestingly yes i i love books actually i listen most of the time to the books i walk to the office once or twice so i walk five or ten kilometers per day that's like one or two hours listening to books but then i also like to have them um in and paper to yeah to have them and it's it's just for it, i feel privileged working for the un with all these different people cultures trade but then i want to put it in a broader context i don't want to just be the plumber looking at some data so as as you asked uh, one one book i have here is, is called life it's from a series edited by john brockman the series is called Edge, edge.org. I highly recommend that series. They they have they used to have annual, maybe not that annual anymore, but like they ask a question or a theme to the leading philosophers, scientists, thinkers of today. And then uh, you can skip individual chapters. Okay, this author or this team I, I didn't like, but you go through short essays. Uh, one along those lines, uh, what I loved was, what have you changed your mind about? Mm. So you ask le re leading thinkers what they have changed their mind about. And for me, this then introduced new thinkers. So there I discovered thinkers like, I don't know, Susan Blackmore or, or others and others you may have known before. So that's one I'm reading right now, short essays to get into. I might skip one or two, but this one is about life. Second one is from... Uh, um, friend colleague here based in Geneva 
Dmitry Grozubinsky, and I hope I got his pronunciation correct, um, why politicians lie about trade oh, there and you what go. you can do about it. So this is from uh, Negotia. So this is more like the broader context here in Geneva, the negotiators. Many of my clients are people like him from developing countries. And the whole setting of how negotiations happen and how it relates to trade policy, what it means, uh, uh, fascinating. And, and I'm not, I'm only like maybe 15% through it, but I like this. Unfortunately, Dimitri, I would like this book as an audio book. Then I would have finished it already, but <laughs> now I can only read it. Uh, third, third one I have here is uh, quite a thick one. Oh, and, that's a big uh, one. Um, by a Spanish author, Almudena Grandes, El Corazón Helado. So I'm listening to this in Spanish. And this is really, it's fascinating about generations uh, living in Spain during the Civil War up to today. And that's more personal. I think my wife's from Spain um, and it's fascinating. Written. And we, I have family through my wife that have lived similar experiences. So I just find it fascinating mm -hmm. it's not that easy the bad guys the good guys but yeah a, a novel but historical that's another area it's like always fun to listen historical. To. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and and the last one here is a bit linking to what we spoke about earlier by ray kurzweil um, um, the singularity is nearer when we merge with ai when we merge with artificial intelligence i had read his earlier books or most of them including the one the singularity is near and now he wrote that book the singularity is nearer <laughs> and uh, is it frightening or yes it is frightening in a way but i i just like jumping into the cold water try to see more the potential of artificial intelligence um he dis he is by now yeah quite senior many years worked on these topics uh, you can always be a bit selective about your own predictions that you have made before, and you may ignore the ones where you were wrong. <laughs> but the ones he presents here, where he forecasted certain steps and things that will happen, he was spot on. He was spot on with the timing of ChatGPT, was spot on with many things. So, so this one I highly recommend. Uh, this one I've actually already finished, um, um, and it's I think he so far was right with his forecasts, in my view. And if this is true, what he's writing there, then the things we discussed uh, 10 minutes ago about the steps of digitalization, of transformation, uh, are very spot on and very, very important also for our industry. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's like you said, it's scary and it's um, we have to keep our eyes open because there there are a lot of potential things that can happen uh jan uh i appreciate you coming on to give a really great view of what's going on with what you're doing today I, I think it's fascinating because i think it's such especially the data part is so well related to what we do on a day-to-day -day in the maritime space it's invaluable um especially the work that you do uh, with, with the people that have like kind of like not as big as the voices as a lot of the more developed nations so jan thank you for coming on the podcast thank you